Greetings in the name of Christ to all of you. I'm Reverend Joan Pell and I bring you warm welcome this morning on behalf of the Ipswich Methodist Circuit. It would be lovely to know that you are worshipping with us this morning and if you're watching this on the Methodistic website just above this video is a sign in form where you can type your name and your location and click the red button and then we'll know that you were here. In our service today, local preacher, Professor David Wellborn, is preaching and he's preaching on the parable of the talents that he has entitled Risky Discipleship. And may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please join me now in our call to worship. Your parts are going to be on the screen in white. Come. Share the joy of the Lord. Delight in God's goodness. Praise God who gives each person a special gift to be nurtured and shared. Lord, we thank you for these gifts. Come, let us worship God who entrusts us with so much. Lord, make us worthy of your love and trust in us. So let us sing and pray together, beginning with number 124 in Singing the Faith, for the fruits of all creation, as we ponder together the many gifts that we have received and how we use them. For the fruits of all creation, thanks be to God. For the gifts to Let us come before God now in prayer. Awesome God, you created the world and all that is in it. You blessed each element of creation with your love. You called us to be your witnesses and to serve you. Be with us this day as we come to worship you. Open our hearts and spirits and let your healing and empowering love flow in. Prepare us to be witnesses to your power and love as we use the gifts with which you have blessed us in your service. And yet, we acknowledge that there have been times when we've not shared the riches of your kingdom with others times when we have taken the easy route, choosing options that require less time, less energy, less thought, times when we have turned back to the ways of the world that are contrary to the values of your kingdom. And in a moment of quiet, we bring now into your light our own personal confessions.
Lord, we remember you are a God of mercy and grace who forgives us and transforms us by the power of your spirit into the people that you have truly made us to be. Amen. Hear the good news. In the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Reading our scripture today is lay worker Rachel Wainwright. She's the outreach and pastoral worker for Chelmer Diston and Holbrook Methodist Churches. Our reading today is from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. And I'm reading from the New International Version. And it's Jesus telling parables, and this is the parable of the talents. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. For everyone who has will be given more and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm fascinated by the way that different gospel writers develop their narrative and impose themselves, their personal understanding and their experience onto the stories as they share them with us. They edit and group the material so that there is meaning to be discovered in the order into which they arrange their stories. This can speak to us and illuminate our understanding almost as a parable, parable in its own right. This is especially so for the Synoptic Gospels, for Matthew, Mark and Luke, for whom the real purpose of their writing is to bring to life the impact that Jesus had on everyone around them through his extraordinary life teaching and healing ministry. By so doing, they were intent on keeping alive the memory, lest it should fade. They were both nurturing and teaching his followers, empowering them to spread the good news. We see this intention throughout their writings, 
but perhaps nowhere more clearly than in Mark's opening verse, where he draws his readers into the compelling mystery story he is about to unfold for them. This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We need to understand the context in which he wrote that in order to truly understand its significance. They lived under subjugation of a harsh and deeply oppressive regime, almost no freedom. Rome was ruling with an iron fist and to do anything to stand out from the crowd was caught in pain and punishment from the brutality of authority. It was dangerous to talk of any god other than the emperor. In one sentence, he is shaking uh, the foundations and norms of society, claiming that he, this mystery story was so powerful that it was indeed good news, was dangerous and subversive. Here was Mark generating intrigue and stimulating an appetite to discover more of the mystery that would unfold in this book. The crowning element of his introduction, not only is it fantastic news for you, that it is such a must read, but I can't tell you how it will work out in the end. Uh, this is just the beginning of the story and the ending is in part up to you, your contribution. Will you continue to hide from all the dangers of society? Or will you be so stimulated by this powerful message that you will not be bowed down by the threats, but will be active in adding more to this intriguing story through your own actions? Mark is inviting them to play their active part in owning the consequence of the narrative to such an extent that it has no ending, just a continuation, as everyone lives out the story in their own way, to hand it on to the next generation. It's a captivating story. It's alive. And when we turn to what John teaches us in his gospel, there is such an amazing contrast that if you didn't know any better, you might think it was a totally different story. The touch points are there, but the detail is so different. Just as Mark's narrative comes alive when you ground the excitement of his storytelling in the context of his day, so too John's writing bursts into glorious technicolour when you understand that he is not trying to be a historian capturing a factual account of Jesus' life. No, he is so emotionally and spiritually energised by his discovery uh, that his life, his being and his very existence is given purpose and meaning and excitement and passion and privilege and overwhelming fulfilment simply because he has been shown that at first hand, that he is held in the love of God in a way that no one ever before has been able to describe. He personally has experienced this and seen it in action in his short time with Jesus, that he is compelled to share it and invite others to share in the wonder, the mystery, the bewildering and almost unbelievable truths that Jesus had indeed opened up to him. In that context, his narrative, the details are a distraction and nothing matters except for his desire to share the glorious and wonderful splendor, the sublime and indescribable truth that God is not distant or to be feared, as everyone thought in those days, and still often does, uh, but is up close, personal, and the essence of love itself. So what of Matthew, whose writings we've been studying in our lectionary all this year? Matthew's purpose is directed at the Jewish people. He seeks to persuade them. He goes out of his way to show them that Jesus is the fulfilment of their scripture, their scriptures which taught them that they were always God's chosen and promised people and that ultimately everything would reach fulfillment when their Messiah came to put right all the wrongs of their wayward history. If you've been following the lectionary gospel readings throughout the year, you may have spotted that since the first week of June, almost every chosen gospel passage has focused on Jesus teaching all comers the crowds, the disciples, the Pharisees, religious leaders, teaching them about the true nature of what it is like to live in the presence of God. Uh, perhaps it is the effect of the pandemic, uh, but I've seen these teachings in a completely new light this year. 
In all three of the synoptic gospels, Jesus talks relentlessly about the kingdom of God. But it has struck me that Matthew has made this a much more pivotal theme in his gospel than the others. For three months, four months, we've almost not wandered away from stories of the kingdom of God. Matthew, who writes to the Jews, the people who so revere God that they're afraid to speak his name, never mentions the kingdom of God, but he instead describes it as the kingdom of heaven. But I think we can be safe to assume that Jesus used the phrase kingdom of God. Otherwise, Matthew, Mark and Luke wouldn't have uh, raised that so clearly. And, and I wonder if this was a contributing factor behind the level of hate, hatred the religious authorities showed to Jesus. I'm thinking he deliberately challenged their dogmas and rigid, soulless interpretation of God's intention for his chosen people uh, by hitting them in something that uh, he knew would uh, bait them a little. When Jesus speaks of the kingdom of God, he is not promising some future utopia or describing something that is far out of reach. He's speaking to a people living under subjugation and tyranny and abuse of power. He's speaking to people whose history is littered with authority that occasionally enjoys a rich and fulfilling society, but more often than not is one that has fallen far from grace with the corruption of authority, with kings who are frequently described as more sinful than their predecessors. He's talking to a people whose experience of kingdom is petty infighting, jealousy, self-interest and abuse of power by the rich. For his listeners, the kingdom they experienced was the exact opposite of the justice and compassion of which the prophets spoke repeatedly. He's talking about times in which the inequity, the injustice, the deprivation and the misery of anyone on the margins was tangible, it was a reality for most of his listeners. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, he is contrasting their everyday experience of life in a kingdom ruled by a tyrannous, powerful elite with the experience they could have if they submitted to the will and purpose set out for them by God. Not a theoretical, abstract and distant kingdom, but one that was attainable if they could shed their attitudes and behaviours dominated by their own self-interest and instead recognise and follow God's ways of justice and mercy and humility and generous love for all. Just take a look at the numerous parables Jesus tells us about the kingdom of God, which all illustrate the behaviours and attitudes reflecting God's will and desire for his people. Life in God's kingdom has none of the harsh brutality, corruption or selfishness that they lived amongst. With that in mind, today's reading tells of the wealthy and powerful man settling his affairs so that he can go travelling. In this kingdom, built on God's values, he knows and understands the people who work for him. He trusts them. He recognises that they're not all identical, but that they have different abilities and skills. And so he gives each of them a level of responsibility that he knows they can manage. He doesn't overwhelm them by beyond their capacity to cope, nor does he shortchange them. He doesn't undermine the authority he is giving them by uh, overloading them or micromanaging them with detailed instructions, nor does he set expectations for them or make demands on them. He simply demonstrates his trust in them and leaves his affairs in their hands. His own behaviours and lifestyle that they've watched for many years have left a clear template for them to follow and he's trusting them and expected them to follow it. When he returns, each of them comes back and explains how they've looked after his affairs and put his trust in them to good use. But one demonstrated that the only thing he had learned from his master was to fear him so much that his fear prevented him from making decisions or widely exercising the freedom and trust he had been shown. He was incapable of acting. His excuse is that what he has seen in his master is how he exercises his skill and judgment. 
Rather than seeing that as an example from which to learn, he sees it as unattainable, so he doesn't even try. He ignores those strengths of his master uh, that, are, that are encouraging, that are trusting. He ignores the discernment of his master that's given him something that he can cope with. Instead, he's diminished by fear, given every opportunity to observe, to learn, to follow the example he'd been shown. He was too afraid of the consequences. In reality, he learnt nothing. And instead of valuing the potential of what he could achieve, if he put his own skills and talents and resources to good use, he preferred to hold on to everything at all costs. Jesus is once again telling his listeners about the kingdom of God, the life that is ours to experience if only we let go of our inhibitions and, set, and our set ways and make sure we mimic and learn from the behaviours God shows us. It starts with understanding our own and others' capabilities, encouraging them and trusting them, observing and learning, putting all our gifts and resources to purposeful use, being ambitious and not holding on to things without purpose. It reminds us that we should not be dominated by fear of the unknown, that we haven't uh, been given set answers or instructions that we have been trusted to make our own mark provided we learn from the character and attitude and behavior of the example that he has set i've wrestled with the idea of the fourth character excluded from jesus parable the one who like the first two put the gift of god the gift to work but was not successful and lost so more all of the money how would jesus have described this man his message is really about the danger of not seizing opportunities and so he doesn't raise this issue but it isn't about success or failure and we shouldn't allow ourselves to be hung up on defining success or failure we are reminded in other parables that success will be determined by god provided provided we are willing to play our part unlike the third servant as mark told us god has trusted us to add the next chapter to the good news. He challenged people living in the most difficult, oppressive times not to hide below the parapet, but to be bold and be part of the unfolding mystery. As Matthew tells us, the wonder of the kingdom of God is within our grasp if we don't hold on to things, but in trust, mirror his behaviours and use all the resources to achieve noble ambitions. As John reminds us, that sublime sense of fulfilment, purpose, and contentment is to be found in his presence and in his love. So why are we afraid and hunkering down in the subjugation of the pandemic when there are still chapters of the good news story to be written? Discipleship is a risky business, but what Jesus tells us is the biggest risk of all is to hold on to what we have been given without putting it to good use. Now's our opportunity to do his will and put our gifts to the use he wants. Amen. Thank you, David, for your message to us and for your challenge for us not to be dominated by the fear of the unknown but to put the gifts that we've been given to good use, taking risks as we do so. So let us continue in song as we sing together Shirley Irina Murray's challenging words, Community of Christ, risk your life for God alone. Look past the church's door and see the hungry and the poor. Cry out for justice and for peace. So shall God's will be done. Number six hundred and eighty one. Community of Christ, who make the cross your own, live out your creed and risk your life for God alone. The God who wears your face.
past the church's door and see the refugee, the hungry and the poor. Take hands with the oppressed, the jobless in your street. Take towel and water that you wash your neighbor's feet. Community of Christ, through whom the word must sound, cry out for justice and for peace the whole world round. Disarm the powers that And tears of anguish into joy. When men is melt away, so shall God's will be done. The climate of the world be peace and Christ its son. Our currency be Let us pray together and offer our prayers for the church, the earth and all people. Lord God, we give you thanks for all your gifts to us, for daily food, for health, for each breath we take, for freedom to choose and for the gifts of your word, your power and your love. Our hearts are truly overwhelmed, O oh God, when we consider all that you are and how you've entrusted so much to us. May we be worthy of that trust. May we be a people who are unafraid to live as fully and as richly as you want us to live. Help us as followers of Jesus to multiply all that you have given us, to risk spreading your word and perhaps see it misunderstood, to gamble by loving those whom others think worthy only of hate, to take chances by doing good to those who have not done good to us. Help us to be faith-filled and to desire to increase your glory and your goodness in this world. Make us ones who share in both word and deed that which you have given to us. We pray for our local churches, that they may encourage us to discover, develop and use all our gifts, those of nature and those of grace. We pray now for the concerns on our hearts for those who are poor in body or in spirit. For those who are oppressed and heavy laden. For those who are sick or in despair. This week we especially lift up our own country as the death toll passes 50,000 people from COVID. We pray that you will be with those who have lost their loved ones and all of our essential workers working so hard to heal people. And we rejoice in the new COVID vaccine that has been found and pray that it will soon be able to be rolled out to the population in the UK and around the world. We pray for the United States after the election there that there will be a peaceful and cooperative handover of power to President-elect Joe Biden. We lift up with sadness the need to have a mass culling of mink in Denmark with the death of up to 17 million animals. And we pray for wisdom and the spirit of cooperation 
in this upcoming week as the final deadline for a draft Brexit deal approaches on Thursday. Minister, O oh God, by your spirit and through us to all those for whom we have prayed and help us to walk faithfully in the path of our Lord Jesus Christ who taught us to pray together as one family saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Thank you to everyone who participated in our worship service today. For Rachel for reading the scripture, David for our sermon, to my husband Adrian Pell on keyboard and vocals, and also on vocals, Elizabeth Storey and Neil Heffelwaite. Thank you all very much. Next week, Reverend Diane Smith will be our preacher as we celebrate Christ the King Sunday. So we come now to the time in our service when we offer ourselves to God, our time, our talent and our treasure. I encourage you at this point to give to your local church and the work that the church is doing in Christ's name. So let us pray together. God, whose giving knows no ending, we offer up the treasure that you have entrusted to us. We offer up the skills and time that you have graciously graciously given to us. We offer up ourselves in service and praise. Receive these gifts by your grace. Multiply and use them through the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish Christ's work of love in the world. Amen. As our service draws to an end, let's sing together and commit ourselves to follow Jesus even when it's risky. Number 673. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you risk the hostile stare? Will you quell the fear inside? Will you reshape the world around? Will you come and follow me?
Go from here to follow in Christ's footsteps and to boldly put the gifts that you have been entrusted with to good use. And may God, the creator, redeemer and sustainer, be with you all now and evermore. And all God's people say, Amen.